What's up everyone, you're very welcome along to this special Anfield Agenda podcast and I'm not going to lie, I've been looking forward to this for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I'm joined by Cash, first of all. Cash, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, We need to do more of this by the way, mate. How are you keeping? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Um, It is always a pleasure to be here, particularly with our other guests tonight. I've been looking forward to this for a good while myself and I'm excited. I'll tell you what, we talk about Nabil Fakir being slippery and Liverpool not being able to get a hold of. Getting Jace Roberts onto a podcast has been an accomplishment. Mr. Roberts, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction both. And uh, and yeah, it's great to, great to be on. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I've been really very much looking uh, forward to it. I liked your interview, Jason, where we welcomed you to the club that was leaked, but we never officially released it because you've got an unspecified <laughs> problem. Well, I... What can I say? You have to leave everything with my agent. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, like you know, like Craig says, I don't tend to do it very often. But uh, but I, I did make a promise. I've been wanting to to speak to Craig, and obviously with yourself, Cash. So it's a, it's a pleasure. Likewise. Right, guys, let's get stuck into it. And I know you're probably both sick to death reading about this, talking about this, discussing it with your mates or whatever, but we have to have a little chat around the transfer window. And, Jace, I'll come to you first, mate. The big story that's... I say a big story. There is no such thing as a big story. But the latest gossip monger or rumour mongering is around Philippe Bacatino. What have you been reading on this? Well, I've got to be honest with you, Craig. I don't know anything about this guy. Never, never heard of him. Um, you know, so... So I, yeah, I can't he's, really tell you. Apparently he's all right. Like I don't know too much about him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he's he's a YouTube player, isn't he? But um, no, it's it's it, it's an interesting one. Um, it's obviously causing a lot of sort of controversy and, and debate amongst you know the fans, especially on on Twitter and, and other forms of social media. So it's and the sort of intricacies of if there was any chance of it happening, how it would work. You know, money owing, would it be a discounted rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's it's a really really strange one um, that um, for more reasons than one usually if we're linked with a player you can see obviously everyone sort of forms an opinion or already has an opinion um, and there's sort of an air of intrigue and, and excitement to it whereas with with Coutinho given the way that that he left and the fact that uh, a large portion of the fan base on the basis of, of how he left have been quite enjoying this difficult time that he's had in his first season at at Barcelona. And um, and then to to see him sort of linked with us, you know, with returning to us, it's a real sort of head versus head versus heart versus um, you know how how we I can't think of the right words. It's it's almost like you know we're all hypocrites at the end of the day, and I think in, in the cold light of day, football fans we are hypocrites. Um, some people don't like to admit it, but I think you know it is it is true. And ultimately, if somebody's going to come in and improve the team, nine times out of ten, anything that they've sort of done in the past can be, you know, and, and will be forgiven if they do it out on the pitch and it leads to success for us. So I think initially, with when it comes to people's opinions on, you know, on his return um, and the, the sort of heart-driven, I wouldn't want him back, you know, wouldn't welcome him back, um, wouldn't even entertain it. If it did actually happen, how long would it take for somebody to... You know, to soon change their opinion when he, you know, hits one in from 25, 30 yards against Man City, Man United, whoever it is. So, it's it is a really interesting one. I've got my own sort of opinion on on whether or not, you know, I would a like it, and then whether or not I could actually see a role for him in the team, because I think that's a sort of separate argument in itself. Um, I personally, I'm, I'm one of those people who, if Klopp would welcome him back, that's enough for me. Um, you know, on the on the sort of how he left and, um, you know, the sour taste, if Klopp and the team were willing to welcome him back, then, you know, that's, that is more than enough for me because at the end of the day, there's, there's still a quality player in there. And, um, and yeah, he'd have to, you know, sort of win the, win the supporters over. But if he, again, if he started, you know, started playing well and lifted the level of the team, then, you know, all, all's forgiven. Um, again, I'm, I'm a self-professed and, you know, a hypocrite and I've got no, no problem in admitting it. But, uh, where he would fit in in the current setup, that's where you know that's that's where I'd have a bit of a you know not an issue as such, but that's where I'd sort of think, okay, you know the dynamics of the team, how would they have to change to accommodate him? Because I think they would have to. I think we all have to admit we're hypocrites when it comes to football. I mean, 
you you just have to like we've done it we see it with regards to yellow cards penalty incidents all this stuff i think if we're all honest with ourselves we are hypocrites I'm, I'm a massive hypocrite and like yourself jay so i'm not i'm not ashamed to admit it um I did see something, Cash, quite interestingly. I flick through the Echo from time to time. When I just feel too happy and I need to be brought back down to earth, I usually <laughs> go onto the Echo to have a little read. And i seen a vote on there today. They're holding a poll about would you welcome Felipe Coutinho back. And I think it's still ongoing. But as things stood, it was there was three options. There was the yes, there was the no, and there was the unsure. And I think it was about 64% of people that voted said yes, they would take him back to the club. Mm. What do you make of that? I mean, that doesn't surprise me because I think, as you and Jason have both pointed out, um, football is a fickle beast and fans are inherently hypocritical. Um, you know, we will, you know, if he would, if he were to return and offer a similar output to what he did when he was at the club originally the first time, yeah. then you would say he's providing what he's meant to provide and we should embrace that. And I think it is, it shouldn't be forgotten that in the six months prior to his departure, even though it was probably to ensure that departure, he was sensational for us in that first half of the season. So if you look at it from that perspective, that doesn't surprise me because ultimately football fans, Liverpool fans, probably as fanatically as any set of fans, want success. And if Felipe Coutinho is perceived widely as a key to that success, then people would welcome him back. I think Jason touched on a really interesting point before. There's two distinct arguments. It's, I think the question of would you welcome him back, I think largely, as you said, Craig, the answer to that is yes. It would be a little bit prickly at first, but I think he would be welcomed back. The, the more important argument for me is do we need him? Where would he play? And crucially, would his presence or would his return disrupt the chemistry of the team? So I think there's been a lot of... Um, I mean, our win percentage without him is higher. There's a lot to be said for the fact that when he played in our midfield, there was a slight unbalance because although he played in that midfield area, he didn't do an awful lot of defensive work and therefore you had a slight defensive imbalance in terms of a screen, in terms of having a protective kind of, I suppose, shield, if you like, in front of the uh, in front of the defensive position. So you would have to say that there's a definite case for the player, but would he, would the type of player he is, disrupt the chemistry and disrupt the real good balance that clearly exists in Liverpool's midfield now. I mean, I think what's interesting as well is, from a, I think what's been, it'd be a massive climb down for him, wouldn't it? I think it would involve an awful lot of, um, you know, sort of at least saying um, the right things in terms of humble pie. But I think, to be honest, his agent has probably just come out and said, in England, Liverpool's in his heart, etc. and so on. Because... If you're being honest, what are his options? Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's a know, PSG cash, you know, where he's already yeah. turned down on a couple of occasions when he was at Liverpool. Exactly. So, you know, you're in a position where, you know, just to bring it back full circle, firstly, we could do with him. I wouldn't be against the, the skill sets of the player being in our team, in our, in our squad. But I think there's a definite question mark over the balance uh, and whether or not he would compromise that. And then the, I think the third pressing thing is, you know, is it is it is this sort of like um, heartfelt plea, this mea culpa thing? Is this genuine or is it a PER sort of play by his agent? Because his agent knows that he's essentially been ostracised at Barcelona because of Antoine Griezmann's arrival, if we're being honest. Um, and then beyond that, beyond PSG, what are what are his genuine options in terms of wages, in terms of you know who can afford him, whether on loan or permanently? You're 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 counting the number of genuine options on one hand, and I think as a result of that whatever his agent says has to be taken with a pinch of salt because I think they're very much the words of someone who is saying on his player's behalf that his player has made a massive fucking mistake career-wise and now he's thinking, shit, what do I do? I could be wrong on this, Jace, but when he went to Barcelona, did he take a wage cut when he left Liverpool to join Barcelona or do you think that was just PR spin? I would imagine PR spin, but um, I mean, who's to who's to know? There's so much talk, um, so much, you know, it, sort of inner workings with clubs and player contracts and such. Then um, when it comes to basic wages and bonuses and, and such, you know, the the wildly sort of conflicting information that tends to be sort of leaked um, to benefit, you know, whichever sort of fan base the, you know, said, you know, said um, media is, is trying to trying to appease or rile up, um, then, then I don't know. I mean, I... I would doubt it. Um, you know, I, I would doubt if that was legitimately the case. 
but then again, um, you know, with uh, with Coutinho saying for such a long time publicly, and you know that Barcelona was the team that that he wanted, you know, to go to, and the only team that he'd leave us for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then possibly, um, you know, but uh, whichever whichever way you look at it, it's certainly been a move that, on the face of it, right now, you know, hopefully, um, you know, he, he probably he probably regrets, and yeah. um, it, it sounds awful me saying hopefully. But then, obviously, you know, from from a Liverpool fan's perspective, I was obviously really disappointed to see him go. And um, you know, we care about Liverpool more than more than we do Phil Coutinho at this stage. True. Um, there's a couple of things, Cash. About one, I want to get back to what Kedra Option said in a couple of moments. But what Jay's touched on there was this was his dream move. It didn't work out. This could be used as a warning for other players who may think the grass is greener because. Sometimes players are spoiled at Anfield. Like the reception that they get, the love and the adoration that they get from the fans, the loyalty that they get. You're never hearing somebody getting booed while they're playing for Liverpool. Never. It just wouldn't simply yeah. wouldn't happen. So for Felipe Coutinho to get booed and to have his number taken off him by Antoine Griezmann, a player who the the Barcelona have signed, albeit under a bit of a cloud with the way the um the release clause was met. I don't know. Atleti aren't happy they want the higher one Barcelona mm. paid the lower one but look as it is he's a Barcelona player and it's not a good look when you don't have a number going into the new season to be fair actually I looked at that and I think um, Griezmann's actually wearing the number 17 you look at the you look at his um, you look at Barcelona's Instagram which I did a little while ago I'm almost certain he's wearing the number 17 interesting yeah interesting. let me just I'll just I'll just double check that because I'm I'm so, hold on, where are we? While Cash is checking that, Jay, so let me just come back to you on key Jurabshin. Now, sometimes with these potential transfers, you've got transfers, you've got to read between the lines. And as Cash said, maybe key Jurabshin is starting to just maybe pave the way or plant the seed in Liverpool fans' head of a, a possible reconciliation. And also, if you're Michael Edwards and you know, one, Barca want Neymar, two, that they're already struggling for money, um, this muted two-year loan deal with an agreement at the end of it to basically write off the 88 million now when i say write off i want to be very clear here some people think that this is just fictional money that doesn't exist and liverpool can just strike a pen through something on a page that 88 million goes away that 88 million is money we have accounted for so if it's written off it's still money that we would have had so it's still an 88 million but if there's a man who can go in and bend the situation to his will it's michael edwards mm. Oh, definitely, definitely, and I mean, firstly, there's there's no doubt about it that um, his agent Jurabchin is is saying that planting a seed, looking at a possible scenario, not necessarily something that you know that, that's immediately you know in front of them, um, but uh, but certainly with a view to okay, well, if it happens, if we need to start you know looking into to moving the player on. And uh, you know we we certainly would like Liverpool to to be an option, as you say. There's there's so few options there for him that um, I think it's it's a play obviously from his agent to just put the you know put the feelers out there. And yeah. um, he doesn't he, he doesn't need to do it. So it's it's putting the feelers out there, sending you know a bit of a message to the club, sending a bit of a message to the to the fans to see what the sort of immediate response would be, um, and uh, and then sort of covering a potential scenario for his client i mean at the end of the day he's working in the best interest of his client so with that in mind you know it's it's probably a good move on their part yeah so, Cash, how have you so, how yeah, have you come uh, up with the number he's seven it's 17 because wow. i saw that and i thought that's interesting he's, he's actually wearing 17 according to their official instagram barcelona so i mean that's that's obviously that's obviously one thing but that doesn't in any way um or it doesn't really totally negate the fact that his arrival, coupled with the fact that the fans don't like him very much, um, really does push Coutinho further out, sort of onto the periphery. And Craig, you made a really good point before, before I went and checked off the um the Griezmann fact and or the Griezmann number, sorry. And it's that players are spoiled at Anfield, and I think if this move has shown one thing, it's shown that Coutinho, to my mind, is very very mentally fragile. Like he's very, he needs the love. Like you know, like some players really don't mind sort of that like you know cantankerous you know combative relationship with the fans he very clearly and most suggestions that are his character is very meek as well he very clearly needs that loving relationship to perform at his best 
And that doesn't exist at Barcelona now, and it doesn't look like it's going to exist moving forward. So you're right to say that players are spoiled at Anfield, and I think there's going to be a massive element of regret over the fact that Coutinho possibly forgot about how important the role, how important the fans are in terms of allowing him to really thrive as a footballer because I think his mental fragility is very precarious and he is clearly very affected by the fact that they don't like him. So, Cash, for you, and I'm going to come to Jace then, on Felipe Coutinho, do you think there's any truth to these rumours or do you think it's complete horseshit? I think there's some truth to it, but I don't think it'll happen. That's such a like Switzerland answer, isn't it? Um, I think I don't think it's horseshit, but I don't think it'll happen. And Mr. Roberts? Ah, uh, see, I, I'm exactly the same boat. I think it's again, you know, with especially since his agent came out and said that planting the seed, as it were. So I think there's truth to the rumor, but I can't see us either going for him, having an interest in him, you know, at, at this time certainly. So. I, um, I I couldn't see it happening. And Cash and Jake, I suppose one more question before I move on to the, the youngsters because I want to have a chat about them. Do you see Liverpool doing any business in this window, Cash? And if so, have you a sneaky little suspicion who it might be? I mean, I, my answer would be I, no because the, also what we need to be mindful of is the window actually closes on the 8th of August now because of the new rules for the Premier League. So you've got what less than well, you did three weeks now if we're going to the day. So, you, not not three. Yeah, sorry, three weeks. Um, I would say no unless something really, really secretly is working behind the scenes. I think Klopp came out and said after, um, I think it was the Tramir game, or potentially the Bradford one, one of the two where he said, essentially, it's not going to be a big window. Um, and then he sort of peddled that line that he does quite frequently about, the boys being injured, who were injured the year before being like new players, which I know aggravates a lot of fans, but um, I don't think we're going to do that much. And I think, truthfully, that would probably be a mistake because we're all of a sudden looking very light in the fo- in the striker and left back areas. Um, and I think those are two areas that we really do need to address. Yeah, he definitely does love talking about uh, injured players coming back as new players. I remember being when he was in the Aviva for the one of the Liverpool preseason tours a couple of years ago, he was talking about James Milner and he was using the exact same line. It's going to be like having a new player back. So I think you've nailed it on that one, Cash. Um, he does love... He does, and do you know what? He's usually proven to be correct as well. I mean, I, I don't know. I think he is largely... Um, his tra- Klopp's transfer policy, I think, is pretty flawless. I think money is spent when required, but it's not just sort of recklessly thrown at the team to try and redress the issues and I think that's a really good policy but I do think if the season doesn't start brilliantly or we don't you know do as well as we did last season initially I think that line of these players will be like new signings I think that will become very old rhetoric very quickly and I think the fans will be a bit like well that was slightly naive wasn't it Jurgen particularly when you know Man City are rolling out Rodri and you know and other who else they sign and I think that is problematic. Um, it's all right, Cash. Think... All you do there is just start an FSGO campaign and it's all good. Oh, well, apparently so. Apparently some Twitter accounts would like if we did that. But, you know, sadly, or in a good way, I, I, I'm a reasonable person. So what I would say instead is that I think you've got to trust Klopp. You've got to trust his... Um, he's earned that trust. Um, but at the same time, you cannot ignore the fact that you can't, you can't manufacture... A left back out of nowhere. You can't really make James Milner do it again. Um, this whole Lalana as a six thing, you know, people are laughing about it. But if that's a genuine option, is that okay? Is that acceptable? You know, and then obviously, when you consider that Firmino's not back until the 29th of July, you know, another two weeks from now, you're in a position where you have Ryan Brewster or Rigi as your only real true striker options going into the season potentially, or you know, the week before the beginning of the season. So, it's. I think work needs to be done, and if it's not, people won't be particularly happy. And Jace, for you, do you see anything being done between now and when the window closes? Again, very much in the same boat as Cash with this, because the more time sort of goes on, the the less confidence I am. I think we all were pleasantly surprised by the, the surprise um, sort of signing of Fabinho and how that was done you know so so under the cover and there wasn't you know much talk about it in fact I think there was more talk about Fabinho to Man United um but Fabinho has come out and said that you know the the move was in the making sort of months and months beforehand um 
and and so obviously it wasn't you know it was a shock to us that it was kept so you know kept so well hidden um but i think again where we're getting to that stage now where a lot of people like to say and i i mean i'm not sure that it's that it's proven but the club likes to do his business early um a lot of excuses have been sort of made for okay well we've got afcon and you know, and, and such going on, so that may well have an effect, um, especially when it comes to Nicolas Pepe, um, who we're heavily linked with. Um, you know, if you're looking at sort of French journalists and the like, um, but strongly denied by any sort of journalists on, uh, you know, in uh, in the UK. So I can't see much, if if anything, being done. Um, I think if anything is done, it'll be more likely on the on the youth side. Um, you know, as uh, as uh, Vandenberg, um, you know, was, was sort of a surprise signing and, and one that was bigged up almost as somebody who, OK, you know, he's a, he's a youngster, um, but he is going to be training with the first team. And, you know, he's, he's certainly one who they're, they're looking to fast forward his progression, you know, into into first team action. Um, so possibly something like that. But uh, I also you know, tend to think that if we don't make, you know, make a, a couple of signings in, in the key areas with, you know, key areas being, a, you know, a pacey wide attacker slash, you know, wide forward, then whatever, whatever the, the cool name for it is these days um, and cover at left back, then it could come back to, to bite us in the arse. Um, you know, it is a, it is a big worry. I know Klopp, you know, is, is very much about loyalty, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and giving his word, and he's made, you know, promises apparently, you know, to to Brewster and how much game time Brewster's going to have. And certainly, you know, he seems like a, a massive talent, um, you know, and it's really exciting to see how he sort of copes with that step up and, you know, and, and, and how he's integrated and how well he does. Um, you've got Origi with his new contract, which is great. You know, he, he has obviously earned that, mm. but ni- neither one of those are that sort of pacey, wide, direct forward that I think if Mane or Salah or God forbid both of them weren't in that team, neither of those players are sort of direct replacements then. It's hard to get a direct replacement in terms of quality, but stylistically. Mm. Um, and my worry, and if the same applies to left back as well, is that the the way that we play, the way that, the, that our forwards play, but then also our... Um, reliance on on fullbacks providing the width and creativity. Um, if you take any of those elements out um, for any period of time, and, and God forbid it be a prolonged period of time, um, then it affects the whole dynamic of the team and what made us successful. Um, we do have that potentially, you know, many more games this season. Um, you know, if you want to, to to win more trophies, continue the success, go that one step further in the Premier League. Um, and also, obviously, you know, make make progression and, and do as well as we can in the Champions League again. Then all it takes, you know, if you something happened to Andy Robertson, whether that was you know an injury or, or suspension, less so probably with you know with with Trent. Um, but but even you know even then, I'm still slightly uncomfortable that if Trent comes out um, and just say Gomez is doing well at, at centre back, then moving him. To, to right back again he's he's a very different type of player to Trent at right back and then all of a sudden you're you are as good as Klopp is and you know and and again you know he's he, he certainly knows you know knows a lot more than us he, he doesn't need to listen to anything that we say but from a from an outsider's perspective from a fan perspective what brought us to the dance and you know how, how great we were last year and the way that he's got this team playing it concerns me and worries me that if anything were to happen to any of those key players, then that there's a there's a shift in the dynamics of the team, and then that can have a detrimental effect on you know on on the rest of the season. So it is, it is a concern. It definitely is a concern. Yeah. Um, what we can do though is we can talk about the players that we've seen so far in pre-season and some of the younger guys. And and Cash, I know you wanted to have a word about in particular about yesterday's game at Bradford and what it was an aid of and where the money was going. Yeah, no, just a, just a quick one. I know, obviously, Craig, that you've spoken um, really, really well about this on the shows yesterday, but just I think the game yesterday, the football really did take a secondary place when you consider um, the the fact that it was go- all the proceeds were going to towards Stephen Darby and obviously the M&D Foundation. 
Uh, and I think anybody who hasn't watched um, Stephen Darby's speech from the game, it's on the Liverpool website. Um, I would encourage you to watch it because it is genuinely really, really like poignant. That I had tears in my eyes when I was watching it. And I think, um, I guess, we when you look at footballers generally, you think that they have this life um, that's aspirational that only that we can only dream of. But then you see a former footballer that's had to retire because he's got a degenerative neuron disease and he'll never recover and he'll only get worse. And it does sort of put it into perspective. That was that was all that I wanted to say really on it. But I think, you know, obviously beyond that, the football was significant too. But just a quick word on that. Yeah, I think the club are very socially responsible and in, in stuff like this. I mean, look at the two friendlies we played so far, Cash. It's been Tramway Rovers and it's been Bradford and both have ties to the club in different ways. So I always love that the club do this every summer um, and long may continue. But I want to start breaking down different areas of the pitch. So let's, first of all, Cash, look at the front three or the front three young players that we've seen unleashed so far. I know we've seen more, but I want to concentrate on just these three because time is against us. So Ryan Kent, Harry Wilson and Rian Brewster. For me, um, we'll talk about Brewster in his own unique way, but there's a bit of a battle going on between Ryan Kent and Harry Wilson, I think, to try and catch the manager's attention. And two games in, or one set of 45 minutes twice, for me, Ryan Kent has been head and shoulders above Harry Wilson and what I've seen in pre-season. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, um, and that surprised me, if I'm honest, because I had felt prior to this, um, and I still i am not entirely sure my mind's changed completely, but I felt completely before that, Harry Wilson was the much better player. Um, but actually, when you look at both of their respective contributions so far in preseason, you'd have to say that Ryan Kent has looked more dynamic. Um, but if, if we're being clinical and honest and you know ruthless, as I suppose we have to be, if we're evaluating it, I don't feel like either of those players are genuinely going to make the grade at Liverpool. Um, and I think potentially what this could be is an opportunity to, you know, put them in the shop window. And I think, you know, Ryan Kent particularly has had quite a few different loan spells. You know, obviously you had Rangers last year, very productive for him. You had, he was, he went to Freiburg in the Bundesliga. He went to Bristol City. He's had a number of loan spells. And obviously Harry Wilson had Derby and then he had Hull the year before. Very productive again at that level, albeit not, although albeit accused by some of, you know, not performing in the big games and only performing in moments. And, I think with those two players, it is an interesting discussion, them facing off against one another, but then you have to look at the quality of the opposition. And, you know, it's not easy, but it's easier to look good against Tranmere or Bradford, with all due respect, um, than it is to have a genuine impact in the first team when the push comes to shove and it really matters. So, you know, to that end, it's encouraging, but I think it's encouraging from the perspective of potential seal on value because I don't think either of them are going to be in his plans. It does look like Marcello Bielsa was in the, the stands yesterday having a look at both players, apparently. So it is definitely a situation to keep an eye on. Um, mm. Jace, I'm going to move back to midfield now or a little bit further back. And two players I want to throw at you are Ben Woodburn and Curtis Jones. And I want to get your thoughts on those two guys, please. Um, It's, again, a really sort of interesting one because... I remember last preseason being extremely impressed with with Curtis Jones, um, and and similarly, you know, in in this preseason so far, and um, to me, he's you know he's he's the standout um, standout player. Ben Woodburn completely confuses me, um, being a Welshman as well. You know, I feel like I've seen you know seen seen quite a quite a lot of him, and uh, he's he's becoming something of an enigma. I can't quite figure out why it isn't you know it hasn't sort of clicked for him yet. Um, but I think when um, when it comes to to Curtis Jones, I'd like to think that he's that he's got the um, you know certainly the the ability and the potential to to be a um, a key member of our our squad. Um, but the preseason is is extremely frustrating and extremely deceiving um, for me because I think in in previous years I remember seeing players like. Andre Wisdom, um, Ovi Ajaria, um, Adam Morgan, even um, you know, and, and being really impressed with them, and and Curtis Jones again, you know, sort of last preseason, um, and they've they've stood out um, in in preseason, 
to then um again you can exclude Curtis Jones to a certain degree obviously he didn't you know get a look in last year but but with those other players mentioned you know they they got moved on and you know and, and their careers have um you know have, have not lived up to potential expectations then since I know Ajari is still on the books but it's it's something that I think preseason is really really hard to use that from a from a viewing perspective as a means to determine whether or not these players are, are sort of good enough um I think I, I think Curtis Jones he's he brings a lot I like it you know the creativity obviously you know he, he works hard he's not afraid to sort of step up to the challenge um but I think it's probably still sort of too soon for him um you know and, and he would benefit from you know from being loaned out very much in the same vein that you know that the Kent and, and Wilson have had you know had the opportunity to do so um with with Woodburn again such a such a strange scenario with him um you know obviously with his time at Sheffield United earlier on in the season um I thought he was going to go there and um you know and, and really impress and really sort of stake a claim you know at that level and then come January he's you know he's he's back sort of training with the under 23s and uh, and and it never you know it, it never got going for him there so I can't see, um, you know, unless there's a, a drastic sort of upturn in whether it's, you know, attitude application or, um, you know, whatever it is with Woodburn. Um, I can't see him, you know, with a sort of long term future at the club, at, you know, at the moment, certainly. Um, jury's still out on Curtis Jones. I think, that you know, the ability's there. But um, but I think he needs to, you know, to get a number of first team games under his belt um, and then sort of reassess at a later date for me. It is very difficult, as you said. You've got to look at the opposition that you're playing against as well in pre-season. You've got to understand that a lot of it is just about fitness. So I absolutely agree where you're coming from. Um, Cash, I want to move back to a position that Jace touched on earlier on, a position that we looked at or we thought we were going to be looking at to strengthen. That's the left-back position. Now, we'd heard Adam Lewis being linked as a potential successor to Andy Robertson. But for me, this kid, LaRucci, won. Where the hell did he come from and when did he burst through? And for me, he's been one of the standouts so far preseason. I've really, really liked what I've seen of this guy. He's been really dynamic, hasn't he? But I, 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 I am concerned about the fact that he. I mean, is is he actually a specialist? Is he a specialist left back? This this is what I because as, as far as I was aware, he is a midfielder. So. That that's where he's been deployed in preseason at left back, no? Yeah, in preseason, yeah, le- yeah, definitely at left back because he's been making fantastic. I've been really impressed because that left hand side we've seen himself making those lovely overlapping runs. Milner took it into cover, and then Ryan Kent there given an option as well. And for me, it's been the stand outside for us in preseason so far. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think I think of the two of he and Lewis, he's uh, which he's obviously been the more impressive. Um, and I do agree with you in, in respect to the fact that I think the nature of the fact that he originally was a midfielder slash winger and has moved further back, that suggests to me that he's got inherent inherently more attacking instincts than maybe the likes of um, Adam Lewis. And I think with the way Klopp wants to play, with those combinations that he wants to put together in, a, in an offensive sense, particularly like you know as you move through the phases on the pitch, I think he he would suit that. But there is a real you know, there is a real argument to be made once again about looking at the quality of the opposition and, you know, asking, could he perform to that same level against higher calibre opposition? I guess the only way to find out is to blood him in pre-season and maybe have him as the backup left-back in, you know, in the mains and when the season begins domestically and in the Champions League. So it really does just depend on what Klopp wants to do and what level of trust he's going to put in this player. But I think... I don't know how I feel about it because I have very much been an advocate of create a pathway to the first team. I think that's really important, but you don't want to do that and inherently put your team's progression at risk as a result. So with LaRucci, I agree, very encouraging, but would I be saying, oh, definitely should go into the season as the second choice left back? No, I wouldn't say that either. Yeah, again, I fully agree with where you're coming from and understand the points that you've made. It is... Sometimes it's it's difficult to think, are we just talking ourselves into believing that nobody's coming in and that everything is going to be okay? And of course, we trust Jurgen Klopp. But at the same time, it is very difficult to look at where we've been, the money we've generated, and to even consider standing still as a club. And mm-hmm. Jace, one player that 
we've always known was going to burst through in pre-season that's going to be here next season and make a massive impact and it's been even muted that Jurgen Klopp turned down the potential to sign Timo Werner because of how much he believes in this kid and I am of course talking about Ryan Brewster. Well he's been one of the, certainly one of the standout performers for the last two games obviously in pre-season with the you know with his goals and and like you say, he's. I, I love what you've said, by the way. Um, you know, I, I do watch your streams and the generational talent tag for for Ian Brewster. I do. I absolutely love that. And I think, you know, he's he's been talked about and, and bigged up. You know, for, for for what seems like such a you know such a long time and, and extremely unfortunate with his injury. Um, but it really does feel like Klopp. You know, sees something special in this lad, and. Um, and with Sturridge going out, there's that sort of natural, natural pathway for him, you know, to, to come in. He's not being necessarily thrown in at the at the deep end in terms of going straight into that front three um, as a, you know, as as a starter. But it looks like the opportunities are going to be there for him to um, to have those chances when, um, you know, as whether it's coming off the bench or cup games and such like that. He's he's going to be getting minutes and he's going to be in and around that first team. And and have the opportunities there, and and it's there for the taking. The, the signs are certainly encouraging. Um, you've for people who are close, you know, close to the club, and you've seen him at close quarters. They certainly seem to think that he's, uh, you know, a, a really sort of special player, and um, and it speaks volumes that that the club isn't looking to possibly loan him out. Um, you know, as they have done, you know, some of our other forwards that we've mentioned, the, the Kents and Wilsons of this world, um, you know, they, they they very much see him as as part of this first team first team fold, and and are willing, certainly on the face of it, to go into the season, you know, with um, with a lot of responsibility on his shoulders, and it, you know, and it is going to be, and and all it takes is, you know, again a an injury, um, a suspension, you know, and uh, and all of a sudden you've got um, you've got him and Origi fighting it out for a spot in that team. And certainly on the face of it, you know, Bruce is going to be, you know, going to be the one who's given the nod to to get the minutes. And, and how great would it be and how much, you know, how much money are we going to save? But but how great would it be if he actually can make that step up? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it'll be fantastic for us all, you know, for us all to watch. There's, there's so much intrigue for, for somebody like me who I'll put my hands up and say, you know, I haven't watched him. You know, I haven't really watched his progression. I've seen, you know, a few highlights here and there, um, but I'm far from an expert on him. So I've got this real sort of sense of intrigue. Um, and I'm hoping and I've, I've almost come round in my head to I'm hoping he's going to be the uh, the next sort of Michael Owen s player who's uh, you know who's, who's going to come in and uh, you know and almost force his way um, you know into 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 the first team reckoning um, and make it impossible for you know for for Klopp to to not give him those minutes and yeah, then uh, you know the sky's the limit. It's very difficult for me on this one, Cash, because I agree with with everything everybody says. Big and up, Ryan Brewster, and I've been doing similarly for quite a long time. Um, but you don't want to put too much pressure on the kid either. Jurgen Klopp fought really hard to get this guy to sign professional terms at the club. We pulled out of a friendly against Borussia Mönchengladbach last year because we weren't happy about the way they were sniffing around Brewster. But I feel guilty because at the same time, I believe in this kid 100%. But I still want us to go and add another attacking player. And that, that really does leave me feeling a little bit uneasy about my own opinions about the club because I, I'm trying to explain to myself how can I believe so much in this kid not want to put too much pressure on him but then t- say to myself realistically Craig there is a drop off there from that front three if one of them pulls out but you know what I think I think that's a really good that's a good sort of moral quandary to have in a way but then what I would also say is you can believe in Ray and Brewster's ability and you know scope for progression and everything you can believe in that with like with so much ferocity but at the same time acknowledge that he is a downgrade at the moment on Firmino and then obviously the front three around that so that that is a sizable kind of climb down if you like not because we don't believe in Ryan Brewster but because he's 18 years old and he signed his first professional deal and he's you know at the moment he is a talent he is a talent that's going to get the opportunity to prove that he can go beyond just being a talent. But at the moment, his age dictates that that's what he is. And I think, while I agree with the point that you're raising, I think you can believe in Brewster, but also acknowledge that he is not at the level of the current front three or Firmino yet. 
and no one should expect them to be. I think the one of the interesting one of the most interesting balances I think to strike in football is ensuring that the team continues to build and to have you know c- continues to have success on the pitch, but at the same time ensuring that it doesn't just become a club where your academy just exists for no reason other than you know lip service. You need to have a genuine pathway for the, the the best players to get into that first team, and I think we do it really, really well because we have a manager who has impeccable judgment in terms of a player's readiness, in terms of a player's ability, in terms of all those things. So, you know, with 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 Brewster, I think what's interesting about about him and the reason that I think he'll get chances is a, I don't think we're going to sign a striker, and b, he's different to what we have in the sense that I think the reason that. I take more out of how well he's played against this lower level opposition in Bradford and Tramere is because I think his skill set is very fox in the box. He's a he is a penalty box striker, and I think I think that kind of skill set you can replicate against you can replicate against all different types of quality. I think those instincts, if they're there, you can have success against the best teams. So I think with Brewster, that's why I think he has a chance because he is a different type of striker. But I do believe you can say that, but by the same token, acknowledge that he's not as good as Firmino. I think... Can I say as well, able... guys, that... Um, sorry, Craig. I I, I just, just wanted to add on to, to what Cash is saying as well. I think it, it speaks volumes as well. The other players that we've that we've mentioned, the, the youngsters and, you know, whether they're going to make the grade and, you know, do they need another loan and such like that. The, the thing that separates Brewster as well is I certainly have not heard Brewster and Loan, you know, in the in the same breath and being reported. It's it's always when you when you hear Klopp speaking about him and when stuff is reported about Brewster, it's about the fact that Klopp sees you know this immense talent and he's got he's going to get that pathway. He's going to get the chances. Klopp believes in him. Whereas with the other players, with again. Wilson, Kent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's more about, okay, well, they're going to have a chance to prove themselves. And yeah. and this is really important that they're getting that opportunity to stake their claim within the squad. Brewster, there's no question. He's yeah. there. Plops big enough. That's a really good point. I think as well as that, like just as a quick extension, I, and I think that's a great point, Jason. But as well as that, with those other players, those wide players, there's this real feel. For me personally, I feel like they are perennially put, being put in the shop window when they play in these pre-seasons because I think we'd all be a bit it'd be it'd be remiss of us to think that if a suitable offer came in for Woodburn for uh, Wilson for Kent for those three players in particular if the right kind of permanent offer for a permanent transfer came in for those players I think Klopp would let them go I really do it's more of a commercial Agreed. it's more of a commercial rationale behind not doing that whereas with Brewster I don't think any amount of sort of offer for a permanent transfer would let would convince Klopp to part ways with that player because I think the scope for his potential has much less of a ceiling in Klopp's is in Klopp's mind. Um and well it's 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 maybe it's a bit dismissive, but I do think the wide players that, you know, Wilson, Kent, um and Woodburn represent, I think they're more a dime a dozen. Whereas I think you're looking everyone says in football, you know, a good striker, a striker who'll get you 20 plus goals a season worth their weight in gold. And I'm not saying Brewster's at that level yet, but I'm saying he is much more of an obvious asset already than those other players. Absolutely. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just add on to what you've both said there is we think back how far Jurgen Klopp has been thinking about this for Ian Brewster. When Mohamed Salah was accepting his Player of the Season award, Jurgen Klopp, when he made his pre, when he made his speech, included Ryan Brewster in that speech he made sure to let the kid know plant the seed in his head and also I think one really important fact about what Cash said about having that pathway through for the younger players stability is vital to that and the fact that our club and our youngsters know that Jurgen Klopp is here Jurgen Klopp at the very worst will see out the three years remaining on his contract and that gives them the belief that if the manager says I'm good enough and the manager's going to give me a chance then you know what he's going to give me a chance so we had two more topics we were going to talk about, but time is against us, so I'm going to push aside one of them. And I thought, Jace, we could finish up with a little chat around VAR, which is coming into the Premier League this season. So I want to know, one, are you a fan of it? And two, what things are you looking forward to about it? Or what pluses do you think there are about it and what minuses there are? 
see this is where i'm going to come across as a bit of an old fart greg because so far i'm i'm not really a fan it's i'm finding it more frustrating than than anything else i i can see the obvious benefits in terms of the um you know the the controversial decisions and you know those those really sort of frustrating situations where um, a decision doesn't go for your team or, or doesn't go, for, you know, doesn't go for any team. And an important, uh, you know, an important goal is scored, um, but is deemed to be offside or, you know, those those sort of key decisions that um, that can be the difference maker in some really important situations. Um, but at the moment, my my overriding feeling with it is is frustration. And um, that could well change over time. And I'm hoping that it does as the, you know, as the system is refined. But but, but certainly at the moment, um, all I can sort of think is I'm one of those people who believes that the, the, the game can't be perfect. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm part of the fun and con- conversely, the, the heartbreak is decisions that go for and against your team. Part of the debate, part of the banter, part of the excuses that you can make that will console yourself or make you feel better when your team is, is wronged um, and you feel like you should have got something out of a game. Um, when when maybe you know you may well have been played off the park, but you can sort of hold on to that one decision that actually cost your team you know a, a point or three points, um, and you 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 can blame somebody and so some of that beautiful also, hypocrisy that we spoke about again yeah. absolutely shamelessly, but but also then the, the debate that you have with you know with with supporters of other clubs, um, and again I I can appreciate why. The bringing it in i can appreciate the intention of it but currently it just feels that like it it slows things down it, it takes an element of euphoria out of goal celebrations and mm-hmm. and out of you know and out of key moments there um like i say at the moment it's in its infancy um and it's it's causing that you know contra- um, controversy it's causing that frustration um but ultimately it's it's supposed to be doing the opposite um you know it, it's there to to take away the controversy and there to you know, to um, to not slow things down. It, it, it's there basically everything that it's being brought in to do, it's currently doing the opposite. But like I say, it's, um, you know, I'm very much aware that these are teething problems that were likely to be ironed out over time. Um, and oh God, I was going to say, I, I will give it the time. I'm no authority on it. But, but for me personally, I'll continue to be frustrated with it. But then in a couple of years' time, when, mm-hmm. you know, when it has been refined, my opinion may well change on it and you know and the game could be all the better for it i just you know i just struggle with the concept you know at the moment but um but yeah it's it's one like i say i probably sound like a bit of an old fart but but currently currently not a fan i get where you're coming from and, and cash i suppose sometimes it comes down to how far do you want to change the rules and how much do you want to change the rules and an example i would give is goal line technology i think we can all agree that goal line technology was very much needed it's been implemented perfectly it's an instantaneous yeah. system nobody yeah. argues with the referees it's all perfect whereas cash with this there's still room for human error or there's still room for interpretation of the rules yeah exactly that was the exact point i was going to make craig and i think with the goal line technology, that's a clear yes, no answer. Did it cross the line? Did it not? There's, it's you know, it's a mathematical answer, so therefore there's no, there's no scope for debate. But I think with VAR, people that expect it to impose perfection are forgetting that it is a system that is operated by humans who are flawed. So you you've got the situation where the like jason made a good point before where he said he likes the intention behind it and i'd agree with that i think the intention is noble but the execution is flawed and if you look at for example there's a total misinterpretation quite regularly of you know the threshold that you need to meet which is where the error is clear and obvious is that right um Uh, so in certain circumstances i think it's clear and obvious so but there's there's a threshold that needs to be met just for vir to be to be looked at so if anybody remembers last year, um, it was when PSG were knocked out of the Champions League um, and it was a penalty given against Pascal Kimbele for a handball in like the last minute and I can't remember even who they were playing. No, it wasn't City. No, it wasn't City. It was United. It was United, sorry, pardon me. Yes, yeah, so United. Um, and that obviously caused a huge outroar because the whole premise felt manipulated because the, the, the decision that was actually looked at wasn't for a clear the decision was that was actually analyzed by VAR that led to that penalty 
wasn't actually a clear and obvious error. And there was lots of consternation over the fact that we've got this system, but it's being implemented in the wrong instances. And then that's that it almost creates an extra layer of imperfection above the imperfections, imperfections that already exist in the game. Um, and I think what we want as fans, I think, is you want the things that can be righted easily to be righted, like goal line goal line technology being the best example. You you want you want that you want that to be uh, corrected if you like, but I I don't know because I'm not quite um on I'm not quite with Jason in respect of the fact that I do believe it's good. I actually, in inverted commas, like it, and I don't necessarily agree entirely with the point that it takes away spontaneity so much that you shouldn't implement it. I don't think that's enough of a disadvantage that VAR shouldn't exist. But what I do think is that you can't sit down every referee in the world and be like, okay, this is what clear and obvious means and these are the situations in which you must go to VAR. I think there's always going to be a degree of interpretation involved in it and with interpretation comes scope for argument and what that is problematic. What I, just conversely on the other side, because I did a little bit of research into this, and I think what's interesting is that the Premier League have said that on big screens at all the stadiums, they will display graphics um, like on the big screens to explain delays, if there are delays, and they will use the graphics to also dis- explain overturned decisions if they are. Because one of the biggest vices with VAR or VAR is that when you're in the game, if you're there in person, you don't have a fucking clue what's going on because it's the game's just stopped and you're not really sure why. And I think if they were to better that communication, if they were to show a reason behind it and a rationale, I think fans would come around. But as it stands, the two biggest problems for me are the scope to interpret and the lack of communication in the grounds. Yeah, I would love to keep talking about this, but unfortunately time has gone against us yet again. Um, there are lots of issues around VAR, and actually myself and Connor recorded a little segment on it yesterday, so I will get a chance to air my views, just not on this show. Look, it's been, I, I don't know where that 52 minutes has gone, but it's absolutely flown by, and Jace, it's been an absolute pleasure to get you on, mate. I've been looking forward to this chat for quite a while, and it didn't disappoint, mate, and thank you so much for coming on. No, well, thank you both, um, you know, more so than more so than anything. I, I appreciate you inviting me on and uh, and it's been a, an absolute pleasure and could keep talking for another 52 minutes quite easily. So <laughs> I think that that sort of speaks for itself there. So thanks again, guys. And Cash, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on and we will be catching up again very soon, I'm sure. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed this. and uh, It's good to have a new voice with Jason and it's good to have my old, familiar voice with Craig but like in a good way that's all good thank you very much ladies and gents we hope you've enjoyed this podcast don't forget if there's anything you'd like to add please do put it in the comment section below don't forget to subscribe and turn notifications on for the channel as always I've been Craig massive thank you to Cash and to Jace up to motherfucking Reds